Hello and welcome to Something Rhymes With Purple. This is Susie Dent who is desperately trying to let the caffeine percolate through to her brain and to be remotely articulate because this is a podcast all about words and language and we need to be at the top of our game. So uh, I need to try a little bit harder, Giles. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It is good morning for us, isn't it? Can I reveal to the world that you actually (laughs) began, you won't have heard this, listeners, by saying... Welcome to Something Rhymes With Podcast. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm so glad this sort of thing is happening to you. I find regularly I'm sitting at my word processor. I know that's what I still call my computer. But I'm often at the keyboard and I think I've written one word and another has appeared. You know, yes. I could I literally write a Something Rhymes With Podcast. <laughs> what does rhyme with podcast? Purple people, please let us know. I'm not sure there is very much out there. But yeah, absolutely. I am incredibly fallible, as fallible as anybody when it comes to language. But as I say, I'm letting the caffeine percolate. I do have a slight cold. That's uh, one excuse. Oh, well, look, look, I have a slight cold too and a sore throat. Well, do you know what we can do as a remedy is we can climb high. We can climb to the top of the mountains and breathe in the fresh air and let it just sift through our claggy lungs because that's what we're talking about today. We're talking about climbing, but my experience, I remember climbing to the top of, it wasn't very high, it's Mount Snowdon. Years ago, I went to Mount Snowdon. I used to be a member of the British Parliament. Parliament. And uh, my constituency was in the northwest of England, the beautiful city of Chester. Just across the border was Wales. And I thought, I'm going to lose my seat at the next election. I better look around these parts, enjoy it while I can. So the last summer holiday before the general election, I thought, let's go to Snowdonia. Let me climb Mount Snowdon. My wife and I, we didn't realise that in August in Wales, Mm. there's not just rain, but often hailstones. We, we get to some North Wales town and we couldn't see the sign telling us what the town was through the hailstones hitting the windscreen wiper. Wow. Uh, yeah. Hitting. And then I stepped out of the car. My feet disappeared into the puddle and I could just about read the sign that said, Welcome to the Welsh Riviera. <laughs> uh, uh, the next day we were due to climb uh, Mount Snowdon and we thought we're here, we will climb Mount Snowdon. We got to what we were told was the top, but we couldn't see anything. The mist was so great we did not know where we were. Gosh. Apparently we were at the top of Mount Snowdon. Could you follow the paths? We followed the paths. So you were able to see that at least? We saw that we were getting to the top. We were told we, you are at the top of Snowdon. We couldn't see it. I have said before on the pod that I am really fascinated by mountains. I have a sort of compulsion to read about mountains, to read about mountaineering expeditions, to read fiction particularly. I loved set on a sort of climbing expeditions. And there is the most amazing film that I'm sure lots of purple people have already seen that I could watch a million times and not get bored of. And it's called Free Solo. Have you heard of this? Never heard of it. Oh, my goodness. I was lucky enough to see it in a cinema originally, but you can just get it now from anywhere. And it's it's a sort of thriller, really, as well as a portrait of an athlete called Alex Honnold, who was, I think, is possibly the first to climb El Capitan in California, in uh, Yosemite, without any ropes or anything. Mm. And there are so many extraordinary moments in it, not least because his camera crew, many of whom had become friends, couldn't bear to watch. So they focused the camera on the mountain and then had to turn their backs because they could oh not goodness. watch what could potentially very, very Ooh. realistically be his death. It's extraordinary. Ooh. A portrait of human physical and mental potential. It is just the most amazing film, I think, or one of the most that I've seen in the last decade. So, yeah, I'm not exaggerating. It's brilliant. I would find it very difficult to watch myself and I would find it impossible to persuade my wife to watch this. Really? The kind of jeopardy involved, particularly when it's real life. Yeah. Though the conquest of a mountain is a marvellous thing. I have a friend, the distinguished actress, now 90 years of age, Dame Sheila Hancock, Mm. and she made a film a few years ago called Edie, which was based on, again, on a true story about a woman in her 80s, whether she's either a widow or she's found her marriage dull, maybe she's a widow. She decides in her 80s she wants to fulfil the ambition of her life, which is to climb a particular peak, Mm -hmm. and, and she does so. And indeed, Sheila Hancock, in her 80s, learnt to climb mountains and climbed to the peak for the film. That was impressive, but it didn't have this terrifying moment that the film, your free solo. What does the title free solo mean? Well, free solo is essentially to climb without any equipment, well, uh, any ropes, anything that is going to sort of give you a safety catch, if you like. And 
I mean, I, I watch and my palms sweat like mad, but it's just compelling. And let's kick off, actually, because there's a lot of vocabulary that we that we need to cover. Good. OK, we're going to talk about climbing, basically, the world of climbing. Yes. That, that's what our language is going to be about today, is it? It is. Well, all about climbing, even though neither of us do it particularly. I do love hill walking, but I, like you, have never actually used equipment to do particularly terrifying peaks or I, I just I'm I'm in awe of the people that can do it but yeah climb itself is part of quite a large family actually so it goes back to the old English klimban or klimban we used to pronounce the b in those days it's got Dutch and German relatives but it's related to clay uh cleave a uh, clammy and clamp and also the clam and it's all about a tight grip in a way mm. so there's an old english dialect word clam meaning to be sticky or stick to something and that of course is related to clay and it's related to clammy and then that if you cleave to something you stick firm to it and it's not easy to prize apart a, a clam and that tight grip lies behind the origin of that word too so mm. so quite a family really when you say, as casually as though we all knew this, we used to pronounce the B in those days, mm. climbing, you would think it's spelled C-L-Y-M-I-N-G, but mm. it's actually spelled C-L-I-M-B-I-N-G. Why was the B making the sound of the B dropped and when was that? Well, particularly when we borrowed words from German or Germanic languages, we tried to imitate their pronunciation. So we've spoken before about the silent K in words like a knight in shining armour, knitting, knock, and that kind of thing. Originally, we did pronounce the K there. Do you remember we talked about yeah. knecht and various German words, but it just didn't suit our language particularly well. It didn't suit its speakers. And so eventually, the K fell silent. And the B is another one. Well, in German, it was klimmen, klimmen. And we put the B in there. Do you know what? I, I need to talk to a phonetician to find out exactly when the B fell silent. But I'm pretty sure in its earliest days it would have been pronounced, as were many silent letters. Because we still say clamber, don't we? We as do. As in clambering up a mountain. You climb a mountain yeah. without sounding the B, but you clamber up a mountain pronouncing the B. Curious. Yeah, oh, honestly, I've said so many times when it comes to English spelling and pronunciation, well, they divorced a long time ago. And it's fascinating because there are so many stories behind them, but it's also quite frustrating for learners. Are clamber and climbing then related? Uh, clamber, and, yeah. So ultimately, if you take it all the way back to its sort of earliest roots, yes, clam was the past tense of climb, in fact. So, oh. you know, how we've spoken about strong verbs before, where we change the stem of the verb in the past tense. I teach, I taught, I bring, I brought. We, in Anglo-Saxon and Old English, we used to actually do that all the time. People used to change the past tense. And they still do it quite a lot in American English. And we've spoken before about, you know, I dove into the I snuck into the auditorium. They still keep those strong verbs, whereas we just stick an ED on the end. I much prefer the strong verbs to the weak ones, which are the ED versions. I texted you yesterday. So does clam... Clam is the past tense of climb. It is. C-L-A-M-B. Yeah. But as you ah. say, we still pronounce the B on that, making it a, a right hodgepodge, really. And is there another clam, as in C-L-A-M, in the world of climbing? Oh, in the world of climbing, no. There is the, the mollusk, of course, which, as I say, yeah. is from that tight grip. And the Old English clam was a bond or a bondage. But, yeah, all part of the same family. Uh, what about abseiling? Have you ever abseiled? Of course not. <laughs> Uh, sadly, I'm a physical coward. My children have all abseiled. Yes, I have abseiled once. And they've all done that bungee jumping thing. I remember years ago when they first, each of them went to Australia and they sent back film of them you know, jumping off the edge of a precipice attached yeah. by a rubber band. So it seemed terrifying. Yeah. That's as close as I'm going to get to watching that kind of a movie. Yes, I know it is quite terrifying. Um, I've only done it in a very sort of modest way, going down a, a valley. There wasn't too much peril there. Ooh. But abseil is from the German abseilen, which means up down and zeil is a rope so literally you are climbing down a rope it's as simple as that but yeah off a high bridge not something i think i can do and you mentioned precipice that came to us via french but ultimately back to latin and it means steep or headlong so originally it was a sort of headlong fall if you like before it began to be used in its modern sense of a steep cliff or a steep mountain do they have a different word for abseiling in, uh, in the united states uh yes they do actually they call it rappel and that's from French as well, and it means a recalling. So it's like mm. you bring yourself back 
you know, you bring back to ah, oneself. So it's the rope manoeuvre that kind of brings you bouncing back up, if you see what I mean. Because je me rappelle means I remember. Exactly. I'm bringing back to me. I'm bringing back to myself. I recall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we, we have that in recall, don't we? We call back that memory to ourselves. If you're clambering and climbing over boulders, are you bouldering? Is there such a word? You are bouldering. That's climbing on large boulders. And boulder is actually a shortening of boulder stone. It's Scandinavian in origin, that one, and that's a, just a large, large stone, as we know, that's kind of smoothed by erosion. But we have all the equipment as well, which is, is quite interesting. And, you know, I, I have to say I didn't interrogate so many words involved as I should have done. And actually, once you prize them apart, you think, oh, yeah, of course, that's so obvious. Like belay, if you belay, you're fixing the running rope around a cleat or a rock or, you know, whatever object you're using to secure the rope to the mountainside. Uh, it's B, as in the verb of action, and lay. You are belaying it, you are laying it down. So much as we might have beset, besmirch, that kind of thing, that sort of verbal B, that's what we're doing with belay. We are belaying something done. You already threw in another couple of words that I didn't understand. A, a cleat you mentioned. What's a cleat? Oh, well, you must know about cleats. Have you, you've never obviously been on a bike where you actually fix yourself to your pedals. Oh, well, maybe as a little child I did, I don't know. As you know, I have a tricycle. Yeah, I don't think you did that with those. So cleats are things to which ropes are attached. So they tend to be T-shaped and they're usually metal when it comes to climbing. But I'm also referring to the cycling sense, which is where you have these projections on the sole of your shoe. And you know, well, a lot of shoes have them, so you don't lose your footing. But when it comes to cycling cleats, they actually attach themselves to your pedal. So you have to remember very quickly when you stop at a traffic light to quickly snap your feet out of those cleats. Otherwise, you will just topple, which has happened to me a number of times. Good grief. No wonder I'm travelling by bus. All this is far too complicated. You have to wear <laughs> special boots to ride a bicycle now. Well, yeah, proper bikes, proper racing bikes. Oh, but, but they're much more efficient, I have to say, because... Otherwise, if you're going up a, a hill, quite often your foot will come off the pedal and you lose a bit of momentum, so they are worth it. And then we have the carabiner. That's from German as well. The Germans, obviously, and the Swiss, great alpinists. That is a shortened version of the German Karabinerhaken, which is a spring hook, essentially. So these are all things with which you attach yourself to the mountain. You have the harness, uh, and that's quite interesting, actually. That's a French one, and it goes back to a word meaning military equipment, so it was actually army provisions that were carried in your harness. So it's had quite a journey to end up where it is today. Harness. Hmm. But that's something you wear. You, you're wearing a harness, aren't you? I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the word. You're wearing a harness. So it's the arrangement of straps, isn't it, really? So you have a harness when you parachute, for example. So that that is part of the climbing repertoire. Rope is another Germanic word. Nothing particularly interesting to say there, but you'll notice that Abseil had Zeil for a rope in it. And there's another German word, Reif, that gave us the old English rope. So, yeah, just multiple words in different languages for the same thing. You'll understand that my ability as a climber is somewhat ropey. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do we get ropey, meaning not very good? from rope. Yes, we think that it actually goes back to a sailor's slang, nautical slang for a riff on money for old rope. Oh. Um, so if, if you have money, uh, the old rope is something that's not particularly useful. You know, on board a ship, skill in handling ropes and tying knots is pretty essential. So you learn the ropes and you know the ropes. And ropey actually was also used in RAF slang too. Although it's possible that in that sense, it links to the old biplanes because they had ropes or supporting wires, if you remember. But the rope, the importance of ropes was particularly high on board a ship. And I imagine climbing too, because I can and think of murder mysteries where tampering with the ropes is being central to it. Yes. Or indeed, <clears throat> the uh, on parachutes, you know, people are tampering with it so that their parachute opens and the ropes snap and Oof. the body hits the ground. Yeah. Uh, that, this is as close as I get to any climbing, um, reading a kind of 1930s a Golden Age murder mystery <laughs> where this sort of thing have goes the, on. The rope in Cluedo, don't you? That's one of the murder weapons as well. Oh, of course it is. Yeah. Yes. It makes it all sound so innocent. If you stop <laughs> to think about it, it's too ghastly for words. It is pretty grim, uh, yes, I have to say. So, uh, yeah, so there's lots and lots of equipment, uh, really, obviously, very important equipment. And Well, what about crampons? 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 I feel that there's a word like that. Yes. 
There's tampons, crampons, and clampons. So I'm not sure that clampon actually exists, but I'm oh. going to check for you in the OED, just because, as I always say to everybody, oh, well, it's not in the current dictionary, but it might well be in the in the historical one. Let me have a look. No, sorry, Giles, you lucked out there. So, no um, clampon. No okay. clampon, but definitely a crampon is, yep. is the metal plate that it has spikes and it's fixed to a boot for walking on ice or for rock climbing. That's a, a crampon. And we know that it's from Old French, but ultimately probably of Germanic origin. But it used to be a term for a grappling hook, which is a device with iron claws attached to a rope, and that was used for dragging or grasping. So that's sort of similar idea. And then to tamp is, I'm not sure actually, I don't know why I brought tampons in here. Uh, obviously, most of us are familiar with tampons when it comes to menstruation, but to tamp something is to pack a hole full of clay or sand to concentrate the force of the explosion. And then it's to pack something down firmly. So I'm not sure whether that is, I don't think that probably is involved in climbing. I don't know why I brought that in. But anyway. Well, actually, it's very interesting. I didn't know that that's what tampon meant. Yeah. So it's, it's to tamp. And when you pack something in order to absorb, that's how we use it in the menstrual sense too. So that's how that came about. Why do mountaineers travel with chalk? Yes, now I had to think about this one and do a bit of investigation. And actually climbing chalk is used to dry the sweat on your hands when you're climbing because there are many people who, you know, as I say, when I watch these things, I get sweaty palms. But, you know, when you're actually there, you must get incredibly sweaty palms. So that's, I think, its primary use. And I imagine that that kind of friction is incredibly important. So, yeah, and it's made from magnesium carbonate, the climbing chalk that you can get. I've just been looking up K2, and it turns out that uh, you can buy vitamins called K2, and they make you feel good. But also, more significantly, because we're talking about mountains and climbing today, K2 at 8,611 metres above sea level is the second highest mountain on Earth after Mount Everest. And I don't know why it's called K2, and Mount Everest has got this interesting name. I think it was called for a while the the Savage Mountain after George Bell, who was a climber in an, an expedition in the early 1950s, because he said it's a savage mountain that tries to kill you. Anyway, according to what I'm reading here, it's of the five highest mountains of the world, K2 is the deadliest. Oh dear, approximately one person dies on the mountain for every four who reach the summit. I shall not be climbing this mountain. But what we want to know, and I'm sure there will be mountaineering listeners, a purple people who can tell us why Mount Everest is so called and why K2 has got this curious name of K2. Well, I know Snowden is being renamed, isn't it? Um, really? Yeah, I think it's being given back its Welsh native name, which is great. So it's being reclaimed. And, I, and Everest was named after George Everest, who was the Surveyor General of India. And the Tibetan name of Everest is Chomolangma, which is Mother Goddess of the World which is rather beautiful. So, yeah, I think there's, there's quite a few instances where actually the proper native names are being, you know, given back to the mountains, which I think is great. Have you heard of an amazing individual called Nir Malpurja, called Nims for short? No. He is an extraordinary person. He um, had a project uh, a while ago. Well, I say a while ago. I think it was only a couple of years ago. It was called Project Possible. And he essentially climbed the 14 tallest mountains in the world and completed the fastest ascent of anybody. And he smashed so many different records. But for me, he will always be truly special in that quite often he has rescued people on the mountain where nobody else dared to go without oxygen quite often and, and saved lives. He's an extraordinary individual and um, I've spoken to him just a little bit via messaging because at one point I was going to go climb to base camp, Everest base camp, and um, I just didn't have the time to do it, but it would have been a real journey. So I don't know, one day maybe it will be something to do. One day, though I believe now it's overwhelmed with tourists. It is, unfortunately, and I think the, the sort of rubbish and the envir environmental aspects were another consideration, really, because I think, you know, you have to think about what this is actually doing to the landscape. But he is an extraordinary individual and, and uh, the purple people should look him up if they don't know him already. Oh, he sounds completely fascinating. Keep in touch with him. I've managed to find out a little bit more about K2, yes. uh, which has been called K2, believe it or not, since about 1856. It's derived from notation used by the great 
trigonometrical survey of British India. Okay. A man called Thomas Montgomery made the first survey a long while ago in the 1850s. The <laughs> policy, interestingly, of the great trigonometrical survey was to use local names for mountains wherever possible. And they'd already marked one as K1 and then discovered it was known locally as Masha Broom. K2, however, they couldn't find a local name for it because of its remoteness. And that's why it stayed being called K2, though for a while it was named Mount Godwin Austin in honour of Henry Godwin Austin, an early explorer of the area. So there you are. But if purple people have got more information to share with us, you know how to get in touch. It's simply purple at something else dot com, something without a G. Uh, are there any other climbing words we should touch on? Uh, oh, gosh, there's so many. I mean, a crag is quite an interesting one for me because a crag, which is a sort of it's defined by a sort of rock feature, isn't it? A, a particularly dominant rock feature like a buttress or a cliff face. It's one of the few words in English of Celtic origin, because when the Anglo-Saxons arrived, the Celts were, were here and thriving. And we know how successful the Anglo-Saxon language was, but it's still surprising that so few Celtic words survive. And it's actually largely in the geography of the landscape that it's really felt, you know, the, the resonance of the Celtic people. So you have Tor, Crag, Pen, coom cross all describing features of the environment and they still survive the lake district has lots and lots of these has lots of tours and crags and pens and the names of our major rivers also have echoes of our celtic ancestors so we've got the don the thames the wye the avon so all of these are really significant names for us but actually they're very few in number and and one of the big mysteries for historians of english and i'm certainly not one of them is why the celtic languages were so quickly and readily subsumed by Anglo-Saxon. And it's a surprise because English, as we've always said on Purple, is so hospitable to other languages. You know, it's absorbed words from other languages and other tongues throughout its history. And yet so few survive. So I like Crag for that reason, because it's, you know, it's one of the few legacies that we get from the Celtic peoples. I like the word crag too, because it features in one of my favourite very short poems. I know we do the poems at the end of the show, but I'm going to throw in this short one now. I may have given it to you before. It's a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson called The Eagle. It's only five lines long, six lines long, mm -hmm. but for me it's so powerful. He clasps the crag with crooked hands, close to the sun in lonely lands, ringed with the azure world he stands. The wrinkled sea beneath him crawls, he watches from his mountain walls, and like a thunderbolt, he falls. Isn't that powerful? Wow, that's gorgeous. And it, it's the strength of the word crag, I think, that arrests you there. It is, and actually, even if you describe somebody with a craggy face, that's incredibly descriptive, isn't it? So it's a great word. Um, there's also beta, hmm. which is quite a nice one to look into, because that basically is the information on how to ascend a climb. So Alex Honnold, if he was telling anybody how to free solo after him, he would have, in effect, he made for himself a whole set of instructions as to where to hold on to, what was the best foothold, how much of a jump from one ledge to another might be involved, etc. And that's called the beta. And it's just quite nice in terms of its story because it's apparently short for Betamax and that's yes. the old videotape format that was then replaced by VHS. But it's attributed to a climber, late climber actually, called Jack Molesky. And according to some, it may be an urban myth, but according to some, he would record himself on tape while completing routes and then share these tapes with friends. So he called them, because he recorded them on the Betamax, he, he called them the beta. But other people are saying it's actually a play on words, as he would often ask, do you want the beta, Max? <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, either so, it's a nice tribute to um, to the climber Jack Molesky. But, you know, there's a lot, lot more. There's choss, which no climber wants, because that's loose rock or loose stones that make life difficult, really. It can be quite dangerous as well. And that apparently is a pronunciation oh of chaos, gosh. because that's what it can cause. Oh. I know, that's the, the peril involved. There's a lot of peril, a lot of jeopardy, but I suppose for the climbers, that is the reward, that's the excitement, the thrill of conquest. I mean, I, I'm genuinely intrigued to know if there are records of interesting or other things said by people when they achieve the summit, apart from, well, we've made it. So if anybody knows <laughs> people who know this world, 
what people have said when they hit any of these summits and it's memorable, perhaps they could get in touch with us. Mm. And I'm just going to throw in one more etymology, which is Jeopardy, which is always a nice one, because Jeopardy was originally used in chess and other games to describe a position in which the chances of winning or losing were hanging in the balance, so it could go either way. And it's from the French je parti, meaning evenly divided game, a divided game, because it's literally right in the middle. Oh, je as in game, J-E-U-X, parti. Yes, je parti. Maybe with the X is the plural, maybe je on its own. Yeah, je parti, oh, an good. evenly divided game. Let's come down from the heady heights of the mountain to, well, who's been in touch? Chris Lutton has been in touch. Dear Susie and Giles, what's the etymology behind the word blockbuster? Was there a literal block being bust? And if so, how did it come to mean something that's big and spectacular? And how old is it? My guess is that the word began to be used in the 20th century as the film industry became big business. But you've talked a lot about seemingly recent words that in fact go back a long way and perhaps this is another example. Thank you so much for your wonderful podcast. Keep up the good work. Best wishes, Chris Lutton from Epsom in Surrey. Well, it doesn't go back too far, actually, Chris. Um, we're talking the 1940s, and clearly now it belongs to the film industry, but actually it began as an aerial bomb that carried a really large explosive charge that was sufficient to destroy a whole block, as they would say in American English, of buildings. That was the blockbuster. And you will find in uh, 1942 an Illinois newspaper talking about several hundred of Britain's Lancasters and Halifaxes pounded Berlin with blockbusters, the two-ton bombs which shatter a city block. That's the first reference that we have. But already, just a year later, it was being used figuratively to mean a really hard or powerful punch. And then, again, very soon after, a thing of enormous impact, power or size, such as a film book or other product. In that, it's a bit like Bikini, isn't it, Giles, which famously goes back to the explosion or the, or the test all. in the mm. Bikini Atoll. And it was where an atom bomb was exploded in, in 46. And the supposed explosive effect that was created by the Bikini Garment then um, explained why, you know, apparently why well, it was given that name. Just been reading the diaries of Chips Channon, who was a a politician and socialite in the 1930s and 1940s, and I've been reading his war diaries and just being reminded of the horror, the horror of the Second World War or the horror of, of any war. But it's interesting, wars do bring new words into the language, don't they? They're surpri For all their destruction, they're surprisingly productive of new words. Yeah, there's a, it's a sort of counterflow. It's strange. But, yeah, absolutely. So a blockbuster was originally a bomb, an aerial bomb. Yeah. An aerial bomb. It's interesting because actually something that in, in movie terms, something that bombs means it's failed, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, it goes down rather than sort of explodes in a positive way. Yes, I hadn't thought about that. But a blockbuster is clearly supposed to be huge. Uh, who else has written to us? Stuart Riddle has oh, a really good question for us. Hello, Susie and Giles. This is Stuart Riddle from Timworth in Devon. In previous episodes, I've noticed you've given us some very beautiful words um, that are part of your list of favourites and have suggested that one of the reasons is because they've got really positive, heartwarming, if you like, uh, reasons and definitions behind them. I wondered whether you could tell me a little bit about some of my favourite words that don't have such positive bents to them. The examples I'm thinking of are besmirch, chagrin and harangue. Um, I'd love to know more about those words. Thank you so much and keep up the great work. Interesting. He comes from Tinmouth, which is spelt T-E-I-G-N, mouth. Isn't it funny? It's it's actually spelt Tain mouth, but it's pronounced Tinmouth. I would say Tain mouth. And he said the word chagrin in a different way that I would say it. But anyway, yeah, chagrin. it's, it's yeah. intriguing. But tell us, have you got an answer to his query there? That's the question. Yes. Besmirch. Well, do you remember I was talking about belaying and how mm -hmm. it actually began with belaying and the b, the be being a sort of you know verbal component. Well, it's the same with besmirch because it's that be again plus smirch. And to smirch was to make something dirty or to soil it, which is why if you besmirch someone's reputation, you sully it or you tarnish it in some way. And it is a, it is a great word. Chagrin or chagrin, as they say in French, is a beautiful word and actually it takes us to really exotic 
destinations because after the Crusades, metal workers that created these wonderful pieces of art, but also very practical things in Damascus and Arabia, their skills were really taken up by European artisans. And one of the things that these European metal workers adopted was the rubbing and polishing of fine metal with the hard and tough leather that these workers of Damascus had used and they had taken it from the rump of a horse or an ass and the uh, Arabian term for this leather was thagri, shagri, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, it's S-A-G-H-R-I and in Italy that became something closer to chagrin. But actually, we in England called the leather chagrin and we dyed it green, probably because the colour that the leather assumed after long, long use when you're polishing gold, silver or copper was, was green. Anyway, the French term for this leather from a horse's rump was chagrin. And you're probably guessing where it's going now because of the very rough nature of the leather, chagrin came to be applied to cares and worries which kind of rub away at the mind and it's from that that we got our present meaning of chagrin or chagrin to, to mean disappointment or anything that you know frets our soul or our spirit so it's got a really lovely and quite as i say complicated origin but it's it's had quite a journey across the globe and finally harangue that's a good one as well harangue is Oh, just if you give someone a harangue, it's kind of got scorn in it, but it's also a sort of long diatribe, isn't it? It's a lengthy and quite aggressive speech. So it's not an innocent word at all. And it began with the French harangue, H-A-R-A-N-G-U-E, or harangue, which was a public address, but ultimately you have to go back to an old Italian word, aringo, meaning a public square or a pulpit. So the idea is that people were gathering, perhaps at the pulpit, perhaps on a public platform and holding forth at length and uh, possibly in a very critical way. And I think if you trace it back far enough, you'll find a very old word meaning a circle and the idea of a circular gathering of people around these platforms. So again, not not a sort of straightforward one, that one. So great choices. And an interesting pronunciation again, because uh, harangue, it's spelt uh, A-N-G-U-E at the end, like meringue, but mm. ague, A-G-U-E, would be pronounced ague. Now, why is it not <laughs> harangue, yes. which in a sense sounds rather stronger as a word? Why has harangue come along as opposed to harangue? Uh, because it came to us from the French harangue, because they don't pronounce it gu at the end. So we've adopted the French pronunciation, which we don't always. And an ague is, I think it probably did come to us via French, but ultimately it goes back to the Latin for acuta febris, meaning an acute fever. That was the ague. I love it when you just know things. I throw <laughs> things at you and you know things. You're just brilliant, Susie. Uh, well, I don't know everything at all, but especially when it comes to um, Old English pronunciation. That's been on my bucket list for such a long time that I absolutely have to master this. So, yes, I don't pretend to know everything at all. Thanks for being in touch with all those interesting words. Do, please, if you want to have queries that the genius that is Susie Dent can attempt to answer for you, get in touch with us. It's purple at something else.com and something always without a G. I say you've got amazing things in your head. I know you research some of these words. And have you researched three interesting words to share with us this week? I have. And I've got oh. a bookish trio for you today, just because I have been, um, I've been reading quite a lot recently, actually, uh, which is nice. I have, I have sort of periods where I just don't have time to read, but I am making an absolute effort to read, not just poetry, which you taught me, but also just, you know, really getting stuck into some good Good books. And so I've dedicated these three, this trio, to books. First of all, I'm going to start with a lectory, which... I've mentioned before sort of various rooms in the house which were once dedicated to certain emotions. So you have the growlery, for example, where you would go and let off steam. You had the boudoir, which is from the French to sulk. So originally that was the, the, uh, supposed to be a woman's sulking Goodness. place, quite misogynistic. And you've got the lectory, which is where you mm. go and read. I just quite like that one. I mean, obviously you've got the library, but, you know, some of us aren't grand enough to have a library. So we have a lectory, little little corner where we like to read. Have we mentioned this one before? It's a Japanese word, tsundoku, sounds like a puzzle. It's T-S-U-N-D-O-K-U. And it's the obsessive practice of buying books, oh. but leaving them unread in little piles around your house. It's the story of my life. I've got thousands of books and I've only must have read hundreds. Oh, me too. Me too. 
I mean, it's ridiculous, but I like possessing them. And I mean to read them one day, but I do know I put on the top shelves the ones I don't think I'm ever going to read, but I don't, I can't bear to get rid of. No, it's honestly, and you just think, oh, when, when, um, yeah, when I retire, whatever it's going to be, I will, um, I will sit down and read all day, every day. I just really hope that actually happens. And my third one, which I think also applies to us, and it's a really unusual one. It's, it's straight from Latin, but it does not look Latin at all. Helluo, H-E-L-L-U-O. And it's Latin Ooh. for a glutton. So if you have a helluo Liborum, you are a book glutton. And I think that's what leads to the Tsundoku. Absolutely. A Helluo Liborum is a book glutton. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. My wife wants to get rid of all the books, uh, but and she wants to start with all the paperbacks, uh, which is interesting. She just, you know, she oh, they got yellowing pages, yeah. they fall apart, we don't need them, they're not worth anything. Get rid of them. And I love them. Yeah, I would fight your corner. Yeah. I'm going to hit you with a very short poem because I've already given you one short poem, the one by Tennyson. And this is a poem by somebody who was almost a contemporary of Tennyson's a bit later, the great American poet, Emily Dickinson. And because of what we've been talking about today, it's a famous poem of hers called The Mountain. And the Tennyson was only eight lines. This is only eight lines. The mountain sat upon the plain in his eternal chair, his observation omnifold, his inquest everywhere. The seasons prayed around his knees like children round a sire. Grandfather of the days is he, of dawn, the ancestor. Powerful stuff, isn't it? It really is. Well, she always she always comes up trumps. It's a reminder, aspiring poets, how much you can do with just eight lines and the simplest vocabulary you can imagine. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that we became more articulate as, <laughs> as the podcast went on. Colds notwithstanding and uh, lack of coffee notwithstanding. Thank you for joining us always. And please continue to follow us and, and subscribe and recommend us to friends if you think they would like it too. And for more Purple, please consider the Purple Plus Club where you can listen ad-free and get some exclusive bonus episodes on words and language. Oh, yes, there's that A to Z of poets that we've been doing on the Purple Plus Club. That's rather fun. Anyway, Something Rhymes with Purple is a Something Else and Sony Music Entertainment production produced by Naya Deo, with additional production from Chris Skinner, Ollie Wilson, Jen Mystery, Jay Beale, and... He's here. No, really? Wearing his crampons? I haven't checked. It's Gully. It's Gully.